Hey everyone, my name is Matt Pinker, and in this video today, I want to share with you a gospel sharing tool, a gospel presentation tool that I have found personally very helpful in sharing the good news of Jesus with other people, whether it's in informal conversations or whether it was formally through a presentation of some sorts. And it's called the four C's. Now, before I get into it, I will say there are a lot of other great gospel sharing tools out there. I'm not saying by any means that I'm an expert who has the market cornered on the best way to share the gospel. I just want to present to you a tool that I have found very helpful. Now, that being said, there are, of course, other great presentations out there. Uh, the Roman Road is a very common one you hear a lot where it walks through different verses from the book of Romans. you got the bridge illustration where you have man on one side of a canyon and God on the other, and Christ is the bridge through the cross who reconciles us together. Uh, you got the four spiritual laws. Evangel cube, if you've never heard of that, it's like a Rubik's cube. It's got all kinds of beautiful pictures on it. Even goes through if someone becomes a believer uh, and is converted, like what's the next step for them as a disciple of Jesus? And so there's a few things it talks about there. Colored bracelets. Um, back in the day, you had WWJD. Uh, there's some that I've seen many times with the beads on them that are different colors, maybe like a red one representing the blood of Jesus and different colored ones representing sin and uh, other things in the gospel. And uh, silicone ones are ones that I've really enjoyed in recent years. Uh, I used to have one I would carry around where it had like arrows and a cross and an empty tomb talking about Jesus coming down and becoming a man and living a perfect life and dying on the cross and he was raised from the dead, and there's an empty tomb now, and then he ascended to be with God the Father, and, and the next part of the story is he's going to come back and take us home, and, and there will be a final judgment. Uh, and so I really enjoy uh, the silicone one in particular just because I found the bead ones. Um, sometimes if you get sweaty or, I don't know, like the rope ones can kind of get worn out pretty easy. Uh, it's easy for them to come undone and fall off, whereas the silicone ones, you just slip them right on. And I could wear that while I was playing a pickup game of basketball, and people would see it, and they would ask, hey, man, like, what's on your uh, bracelet there? And you could show them, and you could talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ right then and there. So uh, a lot of other great ones out there, just a few tools that I've uh, seen that are very common. Now, the four C's themselves, and I owe credit to Union University here during my time there as a student uh, in Jackson, Tennessee. I went on four different global opportunity trips. We called them Go Trips, and this is a tool that we used, um, the four C's, for sharing the story of the good news of Jesus, and we would often intertwine it with our own testimony and the story of what God had done to save us and maybe how he was working in our lives. And so... Uh, I really enjoy the four C's. It is creation, chaos, Christ, and coming. Now, in the rest of the video, I want to talk about uh, why I like it, but then I want to go through each of the points, and I'll just say up front, I don't expect you, I wouldn't ask you to try to memorize all the verses or all the truths that I'm going to share. I just want to give you some helpful thoughts or pointers so that when you're talking about that point, you have maybe some reference points for verses you could go to or teaching that could be brought up uh, when you're discussing those points. I'll also say too up front, when it comes to presenting the gospel, uh, I think one of the mistakes that I have seen people make is at the end of their presentation, they may try to manipulate a person into making a decision for Christ in that moment. And I just want to warn you up front that that can be very dangerous. We have to be very careful. Yes, we want to urge people to repent and believe, but not to do so in such a way that we are manipulating them or trying to just get a decision out of them so we can feel good about ourselves. You know, maybe we've gone on a mission trip, and so we want to go home and tell a story of someone that made a decision for Christ. Yes, we want that, but we can't force people to make that uh, decision. God has to work in their hearts and lead them to faith, and we can't force that. We can share the good news, and we should urge them to repent. But I want to share with you a quick story about where I saw that manipulated, uh, and that was when I was uh, working for a kids' camp in New Orleans, 
and we had a lot of inner city kids there, uh, many of them who were not being raised in Christian households uh, or families who believed the gospel or were teaching their kids the gospel. Some of these kids were unchurched. Uh, a lot of them were definitely not Christians. And there was a group that came in to help us out one day. And I remember they busted out their Evangel cubes and they started sharing with the kids, which was fine. But the problem was some of these kids, they kind of basically forced them into a corner where they were, you know, really basically manipulating them to make a decision for Jesus and kind of pressuring them into that. And so we have to be very careful when we're sharing the gospel to not do that. So anyways, with that public service announcement being out of the way, uh, let's go through the four C's. Number one, uh, well, why I love the four C's. First of all, because it tells the big picture story of the Bible. So you get everything from creation and Genesis to the return of Jesus in the book of Revelation. So you can talk about the whole Bible in there. It's also easy for people who hear it to remember going through four C's. It's quite simple. You could even teach it to the person that you're sharing it with quite quickly. Another thing I really like about it is it's very flexible. When I went to Lebanon and came back from that trip, I remember that we tried to uh, basically coach ourselves to and train ourselves to think, uh, how can I share the story of what God has done with someone who maybe I bump into in the hallway and they just kind of want a quick summary of some highlights? Uh, maybe on the flip side of that, you have someone that's like, hey, I really want to grab coffee with you and hear all the awesome things that God did this summer. And so for those conversations, you have a lot more maybe in mind that you can share. I like the four C's because you can kind of custom tailor fit it to the needs of the hearer, the person that you are sharing it with. So another thing that I've enjoyed about it is how you can really easily intertwine your personal testimony and the, the story of what God is doing in your life. And you can spend as much time on each of the four C's as you need to. It's not as rigid as some other presentations where you kind of just hit a certain point or you hit a certain verse and then you move on to the next thing. Um, now, that being said, whatever presentation you're using to share the gospel, we should always, of course, right, if we're having that informal conversation with someone, uh, be able to allow room for questions and to work through different things. Uh, because different people are going to be struggling to understand different parts of the gospel. So, number one, creation. God is the creator. We see this in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, specifically, we see in Hebrews, John, other texts like this, that Jesus himself uh, was the creator of all things. So that's important. Some other religious faiths you may talk with will deny that Jesus was the creator, or maybe they'll say Jesus was the creator, but they'll say that he was created. There's other texts you can go there with that, but it's important to establish up front when we say God is the creator that we believe uh, God was eternal uh, and is eternal. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that uh, they created, God created the world, right? Um, so uh, that's very important to establish from the beginning. Uh, also important to establish that we are all created in God's image, uh, regardless of our gender, ethnicity, age, whatever, right? Like every person is created in the image of God. And it's very important for those who may make claims that we're very similar or, or almost the same, you know, as animals, and they'll try to put us in the same category, whereas Scripture makes a very clear distinction. Uh, Adam... Before Eve shows up on the scene, he's basically a zookeeper, right? He has dominion over the garden. He even names the animals. He stewards. He's watching over the creation. Um, and so we see that there's a distinction between that. We even see it when God creates. He calls every day good, but after he creates man, he says that his creation was very good. So we are created just like everything else, and so that humbles us because we recognize how utterly dependent we are, just like a little baby. Uh, out of the womb. We're utterly dependent, right? So now talking about the fourfold state of man, maybe this will help some of you, uh, but we can talk about the nature of sin and how it's affected us. So first you have the pre-fall mankind. This is before Adam and Eve sin and sin 
has entered the world. Uh, they, Adam and Eve, were able to sin. Obviously, they were able to sin because they chose to believe the lie that that they knew what good was better than God. And this is the lie that humanity still believes all the time, right? We want to define goodness, not God and not his word. And so we are rebellious in that way. Now, they were also able to not sin, right? From Adam and Eve and their creation to Genesis chapter 3, there was a period of them walking in perfect fellowship with God where they did not sin. Now, after sin enters the world because of the rebellion, we of course see that we're still able to sin, but we also see that we're unable to not sin. So for the non-believer, for the person that has not repented of their sins and placed their faith in Jesus, your whole life is one of disobedience to God. Even all the nice things you do, you are still in rebellion to him. You have still not placed your faith in Jesus and submitted to God and his word. He is still not your treasure or your joy or any of those things. Okay, So you are still full of sin in all of your life, even your uh, righteous acts are like filthy rags. Uh, now, for the converted person, for the person who has been uh, changed by the Holy Spirit, repented and believed in the gospel by faith, uh, born again, they are still able to sin. First John's very clear. We still struggle with sin in this life. Uh, until you are uh, dead, you've gone to be with Jesus, and you get a resurrected body. Well, that's to come later. But you will get a resurrected body, but you will also... From the moment you die after that, uh, you won't sin anymore as a Christian. You, you will uh, no longer sin. Um, well, I guess I'm skipping ahead to the glorified. I'm sorry. Uh, but the born again is able to not sin, though, right? Uh, the Christian is able to obey God uh, by and produce the fruits of the Holy Spirit uh, in, in their life. So they're able to sin, but also able to not sin. Now, the glorified mankind, which I'm sorry I skipped a little ahead to earlier, uh, is able not to sin, but also unable to sin. Okay? So this is awesome. This is what we look forward to if we are Christians, right? Is the day when we will be saved to sin no more. And we will finally be free from, from all, all forms of sin in our body. In our mind, our thoughts, our actions, everything. So Now, death enters the world uh, because of sin, right? But this wasn't the way it was before the fall. Adam and Eve, if they had continued in perfect obedience to God, would never have died. It was a result of the fall. Okay, This is very clear in Genesis 3.19. Romans 5 says that sin entered the world through one man and death spread to all men. Uh, and all men have sinned, right? Okay? Except for Jesus. <laughs> now, sin enters the world through Adam's rebellion. We see this in Genesis 3. And I love Romans 5. You see a contrast between Adam's sin and what it brought and what Christ's obedience brought. Okay? And so, um, beautiful contrast there. Go read Romans chapter 5. Uh, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Okay? Our whole lives, uh, we are working at sin before we repent and believe in the gospel. And what we've accrued from our wages, our earnings, is death. Now, you don't have to teach a kid how to lie, Right? Uh, we are born with an innate sinful nature, okay? Our heart is bent towards rebellion against God. It's the human condition, okay? The only person who's ever lived who has ever been without sin is Jesus, okay? Now, I use this test. It's helped me uh, very quickly when you're talking about sin with people because one thing that people will, will do when they talk about sin is they won't totally understand just how sinful they really are, or they'll, because they'll say things like, "Oh yeah, of course nobody's perfect" and stuff like that. But we have to understand why that is so important before Holy God. Okay, so I'll take a circle, and you can do this on a napkin. I've done this on a napkin before with uh, coworkers in the past when I worked at Chick Fil A. And you take one circle and you draw the first circle, and you uh, so take for example the circle in the middle here. Okay, you can see the circle has all kinds of scratches all over it so maybe you just kind of draw some scribble lines on it and you say okay so this circle represents someone who's maybe a decent citizen 
and they do their job and you know maybe they are are you know faithful in their marriage or whatever and you would think of them as a pretty decent good person okay but they still have all kinds of sin in their lives right maybe they tell lies maybe they uh sometimes don't treat others nice like they always should or things like that sometimes they're selfish okay then you have like another circle where maybe you draw uh, and you say, who's like one of the worst persons you could ever think of, okay? Or you think of some really evil people, some people that have done some really terrible murder things, maybe even molested people, okay, and done awful things. And you think, oh, this person's really terrible, okay? So you have those two circles, and both of those circles have a problem. You compare them to the third circle, which is the one you see here uh, on the left, which is the circle that is blameless right it's perfectly white there's no blotches or blemishes in it and that's god's righteousness and god's perfection and you talk about verses like matthew 5 48 where jesus said you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect and so it doesn't matter wherever you think you fall in the spectrum of how good or evil you are we all fall short of that perfection and so we can never be good enough to go to heaven on our own this is where we talk about the seriousness of sin, okay? We underestimate how offensive our sin is to a holy and just and innocent and good God, okay? John Piper once said that the essence of sin is that we choose things, love things, like things, and do things that show that we do not value God above those things, okay? We often underestimate how utterly detestable it is if you think of Adam and Eve, how many sins did it take for them to be asked to leave the Garden of Eden? And they were kicked out. One. Just one sin. One sin is enough to merit our infinite and eternal separation from God in punishment and hell. Okay? This is also a good time. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I switched to chaos. I don't think I ever said chaos. We're on chaos now. <laughs> Because we talk about creation, we talk about before the fall, okay? Chaos is after the fall, after sin enters the world, okay? So we talk about here how hell is real, okay? Hell even, I've heard many Christians share the gospel, and they don't talk about hell very much, okay? Jesus talked about hell a whole lot. And it's important that we are clear that hell is both real and and eternal conscious punishment experiencing God's wrath, okay? There's false teaching out there which says that hell is not eternal or it says that you, maybe it's not conscious punishment where you're not really aware that you're being punished and stuff. Jesus is very clear over and over in the Gospels about the utterly terrible punishment that hell is, okay? So... Go read the Gospels. See what Jesus has to say there. Now, I think it's helpful here. When we're presenting the Gospels, sometimes we love to get to good news. And that's great, right? Because it's good news. But it is helpful. I've heard this said before. Uh, if you imagine a doctor walking into the room and telling their patient about a disease, okay? And he goes through just how terrible the disease is and what it's going to cause, how it's going to lead to all these awful things, ultimately death. The more you understand about the disease, the more you're like, wow, I, I really need a cure, okay? And I, I just put this uh, in here, this illustration of the 90% spend, spend your time talking about the disease before you get to the cure, because I think in many cultures in the world right now, uh, there's just not a really adequate understanding of just how sinful, the, the sinfulness of sin really is, okay? Uh, so... We talk about how awful the disease is, and then we get to the good news and the cure. And now you have to cater this to the individual you're sharing with. Maybe you're sharing it with someone who's already got a guilt-ridden conscience, and they already understand how guilty and broken they are before God. They may, You may need to focus more on the love of God, okay? But I think there are many people I've shared the gospel with who really need to understand how serious sin is, okay? So you need to kind of gauge and talk to that person and figure out uh, what part of the good news they may need to hear the most okay uh, so not that you don't hit on all of it because you know they need to know they're sinners and they need a cure and, and the cure is Jesus of course so Matthew 548 again uh, this is a great time 
if you're weaving in the story of what God has done into your life with uh, the four C's, talk about during the chaos about your the things that you were maybe doing before you became a Christian, if you if you feel like that's appropriate or, or you're comfortable to do that. Um, you don't have to go into gritty detail or anything, but maybe you can share, you know, what you were like, some things that you cherished or loved or whatever before you were a believer. Um, maybe talk about at this time a chaos, a trial, or a tragedy that came into your life that ultimately helped lead you to Christ. And you can use that to kind of transition to number three, which is Christ, right? This is the good news. Talk, you can talk about the divinity of Jesus here. He's fully God, fully man. Uh, and there's many claims to this in uh, the Gospels where Jesus basically is claiming, I am God, okay? That is very clear. Some people will look at the Bible and say, well, Jesus never says, I am God. Well, he may never say it in those words, but he basically says, I am God multiple times okay here's an example john 8 58 truly truly i say to you before abraham was i am okay think of exodus 3 when god appears to moses and he says i am who i am right i'm the god moses who never had a beginning and jesus is saying that's me i never had a beginning i just simply exist moses okay so the divinity of jesus of course uh, there's texts about his manhood uh, more people would question his godness than his humanness. Okay, uh, fulfilled Old Testament prophecy, right? So you can talk about how Christ was pointed to in the Old Testament. Uh, there's n a number of prophecies there. Uh, his perfect life of obedience, Romans 5:19. By the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Important to show uh, that Christ lived a sinless life. Uh, Hebrews talks about how he was tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. Okay, his death on a cross ultimately, right? Uh, we see here uh, the ultimate kind of climax of the justice of God and the mercy of God, of God's wrath and God's love, all fully on display at the cross. Okay, how serious does God take sin? Well, His Son had to die for it; He had to suffer the wrath of God for it. Okay, so you can talk about His physical sufferings, First Peter two twenty four. That's usually very evident. Most historians, of course, are going to affirm uh, the physical suffering of Jesus. Uh, well, I say most, many, I don't really know how many, um, but many of them do. Uh, but there's also the spiritual suffering, right? Uh, God put him forward as a propitiation. Uh, that word means a wrath-bearing sacrifice, right? So shame on all those who would say, that Jesus did not bear the wrath of God on the cross and that would try to strip the gospel of that. That is fundamental to our faith, that Jesus died as a substitute in our place for our sins. He actually took the punishment we deserved on the cross. That is the gospel, okay? This was to show God's righteousness, so he's both just in that he's taking that wrathful punishment, but he's also the justifier. He justifies us, okay, so that when we are presented before God, we're blameless. So we'll get more to that. Resurrection, okay, John eleven twenty five, 25. Jesus uh, says here, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Great verse to go to in closing when you're in a conversation with someone is, do you believe this? Do you really believe this? The resurrection of Jesus and the case for the resurrection of Jesus was a huge part of what led me to ultimately become a Christian. So a couple of books here that I recommend, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus by Gary Habermas and Michael Lycona is a really helpful, really simple book that uh, gives you the tools to talk to people about why there is good evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, uh, both in the scriptures and in history, etc., using logic and reason and all these tools. Very simple stuff in there that's easy to memorize, that they give tools for you. The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel is a great uh, little like journalistic type read. Uh, really enjoyed that, really helpful uh, back in the day. And of course, uh, when we're talking about the resurrection, we can also talk about the hope that Christians have for the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15. But we could talk about that more in the final C. 
talking about how the work is finished, right? Uh, we can't earn our way to heaven. Uh, Jesus did the work, and we obey as a fruit of who we are now as Christians, right? The work is finished, John 19.30. We can talk about God's love for us, John 3.16, right? God so loved the world that he sent his only son, and he willingly went to the cross on your behalf. It was not cosmic child abuse, as some may claim. Jesus could have taken himself off the cross any moment if he wanted to, but he didn't, okay? He suffered in his body on that tree, uh, and by his wounds we are healed. Romans 5, 8 um, talks about this as well. Uh, and so because uh, uh, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, therefore, since we, uh, since he died for us, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Okay, assurance that divine wrath has been appeased. Okay, call to repentance. Okay. Talk about uh, Acts 2.38, where uh, Peter calls the crowd to repent. And then, of course, there he talks about baptism. Uh, you can talk about baptism as well uh, if a person believes in the gospel and why baptism is important as a symbol. It doesn't actually save us, but it's a symbol of our salvation. Uh, call for conversion, 1 Peter 2.10. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Co call them to, uh, to repent and believe. The Great Exchange, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. I love this verse. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we can become the righteousness of God. So, in essence, the Great Exchange is Jesus takes what we deserve, which is punishment and wrath, and we get in exchange what we don't deserve. We get eternal life with God. We get the perfect righteousness of God, like in us we get the holy spirit we get all these gr great gifts right it's a, a great exchange incredible exchange okay talk about your conversion when you talk about christ talk about uh, how he led you to faith maybe talk about what god is doing in your life at the time that you're sharing it with the person what following jesus has been like for you uh, especially if you've been a christian for a while you can talk about some of the trials you've been through if you're a new christian you can at least talk about your conversion right um, and then this is a great time to also talk about what Christ, what following Christ will follow you. I'm sorry, will cost you. Okay. Uh, again, this is another thing where you need to gauge and understand the reader. I remember J.D. Greer sharing the story one time of how a Muslim came to him. Uh, he had spent a whole month striking up the courage to go talk to J.D. This was in a, a Muslim country because he knew that even just going to him was dangerous for him. And he knew that following Jesus would cost him. And in particular, many Muslim believers uh, or who, who came from uh, uh, Islamic traditions and such um, have lost families and such for following Christ. And that's not just them. There are many others, uh, but it is common. And so Luke 9.23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. So we're preaching here not a Sunday only faith. We're talking about an everything in your life faith belongs to Jesus. Okay. This is just helpful to talk about, especially as you confront cultural Christianity, especially in different parts of America where people uh, very much downplay the costliness of following Jesus. Okay. It is costly, it is inconvenient, it is uncomfortable in many ways. Here you can talk about the spiritual disciplines. Uh, talk about, and by discipline I mean here, it's a good word, right? Sometimes we think of discipline maybe as a bad word. Um, but we're talking about the ways you grow as a Christian, okay? So prayer, Bible reading, being a part of a local church body, uh, those are just a few of the ways that we grow as disciples. Those are some of the... Um, the key ones you want to introduce a new Christian to right away that's important from the get-go. There's, of course, other uh, disciplines in the Christian life, but uh, you don't need to overwhelm them <laughs> with everything. Okay. And then number four, Jesus is coming back. Okay. Jesus will return visibly and bodily. Okay. Uh, and Christians hope for that one day when we will receive resurrected bodies and be free from sin. Uh, final judgment is coming, and you are one of either two people. You are either in Christ or you are not. You're either 
uh, a believer or you are not, okay? Remember, Jesus came like a lamb. Revelation 5 gives the picture of the lamb who was standing as though slain. And uh, that's how Jesus came. But he's coming back like a lion. Go read Revelation 1 and see that picture of Jesus coming back like a warrior king. And it is, quite frankly, terrifying. He is coming back to, to reap vengeance on his foes. Hebrews 9, 27-28 uh, kind of captures both of these realities. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Okay, so again, this is not a time, if you're sharing the gospel, to get into the different viewpoints the many viewpoints on exactly how that whole the end times is going to work out with the coming of Christ in particular. You just need to hit on the main points that all Christians should agree to, that he is returning visibly, bodily, uh, that judgment's coming. These sorts of major points uh, that are really important. Um, so uh, this, is, this is a great time for you to talk about the hope that you have, right? Uh, some of you Christians out there maybe sharing the good news, knowing that you're going through serious health problems, cancer, uh, a virus that may be killing you, and you can talk about the hope that you have in the, the coming of Jesus and uh, what you will look forward to. And uh, this is not a faith that's a blind faith, right? We think of Hebrews 11, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen. It's not a blind faith. It's not uh, a faith without reason and without uh, logic and proof and evidence, right? So hopefully this has been helpful for you. Uh, again, there is no perfect you know, tool that's an end-all, be-all tool for how to share the gospel. But I like the four C's because I can keep on track. And um, if I know the person I'm sharing with, I can really cater it to what they need. Um, again... It may not be the best uh, tool if, you are, if you've if you never shared the gospel with someone before, unless you've had someone kind of walk you through your testimony. And so um, maybe I'll make another video about that. Um, and really, I would encourage you to just to think of some key verses that are helpful. But one thing that's helpful about, I think, things like the Romans Road is the verses are kind of built into it. So you kind of have to memorize it or you at least have to know the verse so that you can flip in your Bible to that verse and, and share that verse with somebody. So that's definitely a downside to the four C's is uh, the verses aren't built into it. Um, there's also no pictures or anything like that. So it's really not, um, you know... It's not like the Evangel Cube where that's a really helpful tool if there's a language barrier or if um, you're maybe sharing with little kids. Maybe if you have a, a dry board or something or, or you can write it down and you can show the kids the different steps. Um, so anyways, hopefully this has been helpful to you. Thanks for watching the video uh, and God bless.